This is on the Protestant Reformation in England. And let's see how that unfolds just briefly. And so the Protestant Reformation emerges out of the Civil War of the Roses. Um, there was a very serious civil war that occurred between 1455 and 1487, uh, you know, for more than 30 years. Uh, this is a pretty tumultuous time in the history of England and um, like the time of our civil war in the United States. Uh, the two main adversaries were the House of Lancaster and the House of York. And uh, one thing that seems to explain the sort of breakdown of the feudal order prior to that is that uh, knights and lower level vassals were getting paid in terms of uh, money and instead of in terms of larger and larger fiefdoms. And so money becomes more of a factor. And because it is very transactional, it becomes much more localized so that a knight, you know, and these are the, the military guys, a knight feels more loyalty to their local landlord who is the direct, uh, issuer of their fiefdom than, uh, than they do to the whole hierarchy of vassalage up to the king. They're maybe not loyal to the king, they're loyal to their local larger um, lord who maybe operates like a warlord. And so we have sort of warlord factions and then they break up into families and, and there we go. So the, the system of vassalage, you know, ultimately in the high Middle Ages, when everything was running fairly smoothly, everybody ultimately felt uh, that some way they were connected to the king. And, uh, and that sort of broke down, probably because of the introduction of money payment for military service. Uh, remember, in the old system, a knight was given a fiefdom, a portion of land that that he could run and make a profit off of, uh, you know, enjoy the produce of it, not necessarily thinking in terms of profit like we think today, um, and just enjoying the fiefdom at his pleasure and doing what he wants with it and being a big shot. And when the time came, his lord would call him up and say, okay, we gotta go and fight this, this war, whatever the case may be. That was the way it worked. It wasn't transactional. It was, be, it was being part of a club, you know, um, part of a gang maybe, you know, right? But the gangs were all organized in a pyramidal structure that the, the top, the top uh, gangster is the king or the queen. All right, so uh, out of the War of the Wars of the Roses, we have Henry the, or, sorry, we have Henry the Seventh. He comes out on top. He he ultimately is the last man standing. Um, and when he becomes king of England, then he's notorious for being uh, greedy, and employing heavy-handed taxation, uh, primarily on the nobles who had the money, right? And he was collecting money taxation from them. And uh, he, Henry now, uh, the seventh here, is thinking of wealth in terms of money and not thinking of wealth in terms of land. And this is sort of the breakdown of, of the feudal order is that at a certain point, land becomes more trouble than it's worth. Just give me, I don't need the land, I don't need to control the land and think about controlling the land and what to do with it and getting produce off the land and all that, even at some secondary level or whatever. He just wants the money. Um, and, you know, it's attributed by especially contemporary authors to a sense of greed, but, um, but thinking in this long durée sort of way, uh, 
there's a lot of economic pressures on Henry to do this because the feudal order of land working as property and wealth is breaking down. Uh, and of course, in 1492, uh, in the midst of his reign, you have a big influx of gold and silver from the Americas through the Spanish Empire. Okay, so money becomes much more important. Uh, hold on one second. All right, so it's starting to get dark. Let me turn on the lights. Um, okay, so then Henry VIII, with, which maybe we're more familiar with Henry VIII, um, and he has lots of wives, and of course he wants to divorce them, and the Pope has a problem, so he splits from the Roman Catholic Church and creates the Church of England. Uh, but his first uh, order of business when he, when he became king was actually to execute the tax collectors uh, from Henry VII. And um, then he establishes the Church of England. And part of this is the dissolution of the monasteries. So once Henry says to the Pope, hey, we're breaking with you. You no longer have control over me in any way. And so this is a sense of class consciousness of the monarchy in relationship to the Pope, saying the Pope can't tell me what to do. I am more powerful than the Pope, and I'm going to assert that power. This is class consciousness. He's doing this on purpose, and he's doing it in order to consolidate power. Uh, and, and then he proceeds to confiscate the lands of the Pope in England. You know, ultimately, you know, uh, a certain parish was headed by a bishop, but, uh, but that bishop was then a, a vassal to the Pope. And so the Pope had land had fiefdoms in every kingdom throughout Europe, including England. And Henry VIII here uh, just confiscates them. And to, to some extent, he turns them over to the Church of England and new bishops that may be the old bishops or maybe replace bishops who are not cooperative. Uh, but then a lot of the land is actually just uh, uh, subsumed by the crown itself by the, the royal person and and then uh, and then maybe doled out as fiefdoms to favored people that Henry wanted to uh, gain favor with or reward for previous service he'd give them a small fiefdom that used to be church property uh, and in some cases, he's selling this. You know, it's it's an exchange. It's a it's a it's a transactional purchase of a fiefdom from the king. All right. Uh, and part of this then is that as all these new fiefdoms are created and they're starting to redraw the lines and everything, the laws regarding the enclosure of the commons uh, becomes much more lax. And so there's a significant increase in the closure of the commons. And the commons are the lands like where peasants, uh, former serfs, would graze their animals in order to have, you know, animals to, to milk their cow and to uh, shear their sheep and, you know, just to live in a subsistence way, not in a capitalistic profit-making way, just to keep their family alive. They relied on those common lands to graze and to maybe uh, uh, plant small, uh, small gardens here and there, depending on how the community worked it out. You know, it was a very, it was like a community garden sort of situation. Uh, and there's lots of different ways in which they, they worked that out and, and lots of different things they were, they were putting use, use to it, but, but, um, but they needed that land. And so as you enclose the land, people start to, go hungry and they can't live there anymore. And so this increases the flow of people from the countryside into cities. 
Uh, but then this is also where you get a lot of larger landlords that are enclosing the commons and creating grazing land for their sheep and then exporting wool to the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is building up the textile industry uh, and, and shipping textiles all over the world and creating global marketing textiles. And so this is how these, the, this is one way in which the Netherlands here is connected to England in a very intimate way. A lot of the wool that the, the Dutch textile manufacturers were work, using as raw materials, those raw materials were coming from England and those raw materials were produced by kicking serfs and peasants off the land. Was, they were freeing the serfs. They were free to get the fuck off the land. Just go, get out of, I don't care where you go. I just, I'm, I'm not responsible for you anymore. Remember that in the feudal structure, a landlord was given a landholding as a responsibility. And the people, the serfs, came with the land. So he was responsible for the land and he was responsible for the people. Now he's like, I don't need the people. You can get out. I just want the land and I'll just deal with sheep. I don't have to deal with people. Much easier and much more profitable. And these are money profits. Um, so again, just like the merchant who's cornering the market in wheat on the marketplace, you know, at the corner, you know, at the local farmer's market and, and stockpiling and then unloading when the price is right, these uh, landed gentry nobles out in the countryside of England could do the same thing with wool and they could manufacture a bunch of wool, hold it until the price is right, and then unload and make a killing. And so, uh, you know, that's what they're doing and, and the peasants are suffering. They're, they're literally wandering around the country being kicked out of one place after another. Um, one of the big movements was they moved out to the shoreline because the shoreline wasn't considered parts of fiefdoms, uh, just wasn't considered attractive in feudal times. But then progressively the, the shoreline began to be enclosed and people were kicked out of those places. Uh, and, and, you know, and they just were kicked around the country from place to place to place. And eventually they end up in the cities after you know, maybe decades a family might end up in the cities. <clears throat> So this enclosure problem is, is, a, is a severe breakdown of the feudal order and is really accelerated in the reign of King Henry VIII. Um, Edward VI, he's only nine years old when uh, Henry dies. Um, so we have a council of regents that are, that are running the country and the regions that have uh, that Henry has really placed uh, around Edward are militant Protestants, and so they're very, you know, they're very concerned. And, and it doesn't seem like Henry was much of a tr true believer. Uh, you know, his, you know, he had his own reasons for creating the Church of England. Uh, but he did have these militant Protestants around him, so he saw an opportunity to took it. Uh, but then these militant Protestants end up running the country, and they're really serious about, you know, structuring the Church of England uh, in along their theological lines. They issue the Book of Common Prayer, so these are actual prayers uh, that are to be said in services and even instructions for. You know, this week you do this, this week you do that. Lots of instructions about how to uh, do the church service so that everybody is basically doing the same thing on any given Sunday uh, throughout the calendar year. This results in the prayer book re rebellion, um, which is partly about the prayer book and these reforms. You know, people are still inclined to be more Catholic. And this, this, Protestantism is a new thing, and, and the government is trying to force people to become Protestants. 
Um, so they're protesting about, about that, but they're also protesting about the enclosure of the commons. It's the, you know, the same people that are suffering from the enclosure of the commons are the same people that are tied to more traditional forms of worship. Uh, and they're, so there's, you know, uprisings. Um, there's also Ket's Rebellion that occurs at the same time, um, but it's a little more focused, it's much more focused on the issue of land enclosures. They really just, it's not like rioting, uh, like the other uprisings, but it's very specifically targeted at landlords who had recently enclosed commons and they would attack these lords in a military fashion. And they, 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 uh, they established a small rebel army for this purpose, um, uh, but then were quickly put down. Now, Mary uh, comes onto the throne there's the incident of Lady Jane Grey, if you're familiar with that, right before Mary takes takes the, the throne. Um, but that's a very short incident. Um, now, Mary is, marries, shortly after being crowned, she marries Prince Philip of Spain, who I talked about earlier, who was the son of Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, who was also king of Spain that we talked about, you know, in relationship to uh, Las Casas uh, and a few lectures back. Um, she is a Catholic. She is like a militant Catholic and uh, she's known uh, in some circles as Bloody Mary because of her attempt to restore Roman Catholicism by force. So she revives the Catholic Church. Uh, she revives heresy acts that were previously um, Catholic in nature. And in the wake, in the wake of these heresy acts, that now we're enforcing Catholicism. You know, before for years it was the Catholics who were being persecuted. And, and forced to become Protestants, now they're being persecuted for being Protestants. It could be the same people and they're just being shoved back and forth. Uh, 800 wealthy Protestants flee, okay. Uh, 283 Protestants are burned at the stake. I think not all of those are actually burned at the stake, but a lot of them are burned at the stake. There's a lot of burning at the stake going on. Uh, and it's a public spectacle. Um, and it creates a lot of backlash. And, and then uh, at this time, uh, an underground church forms in London that has um, hundreds of members, if, if not more, um, during this time. Now, this is right about the time that the Peace of Augsburg, back with the Holy Roman Empire, and the settlement of the Reformation in the Holy Roman Empire has been accomplished. In England, they're reverting back to, uh, you know, like the techniques of the Spanish Inquisition, which is going on very heavily in Spain. And Prince Philip uh, of Spain is the is is now the consort of the Queen, and they're sort of doing uh, the English Inquisition, uh, but in a more independent way in, in England, and it's um, uh, quite horrendous. And right about this time, uh, Philip becomes king of the 17 provinces, uh, provinces of the Netherlands that I talked about before. So now he's the king of the Netherlands. He's the king of Spain. Uh, and throughout this, they don't have any children. So succession to the throne now is up in the air. Uh, and, and that's where Elizabeth and the Elizabethan era comes in. Uh, because Elizabeth is the daughter of Henry VIII. Okay, so I'll, I'll cut it off there. Um, I got to take care of my daughter, and I will see you in the next video.